Okay, Chuck. So why don't you just uh, why don't we start by just giving a bit of an introduction? Who are you? What is o, uh, o, and who is Osuji and Smith? Just a very brief intro. Okay. Uh, first of all, Drew, it's good to see you again. You uh, as well, pal. Yeah, um, well, my name is Chuck Dimiri. Um, I'm a senior associate with um, Osuji and Smith Lawyers. Uh, Osuji and Smith Lawyers is uh, probably the biggest black owned law firm. Uh, right now in Canada. Um, and the exciting thing about Osuji and Smith is that we are also dedicated to giving opportunities to um, you know, foreign trained individuals, foreign trained lawyers, um, our opportunities to come to Canada, to come to Alberta, to article, to through our foot in the door initiative, um, which is an initiative that was brought on board by the managing partner, uh, Charles Osuji, also a foreigner himself. Uh, you know, so yeah. um, he went through the crucibles of, of um, you know, getting to get to practice law in Alberta. Yeah. And so when he established this place, he decided that uh, some of the headaches, you know, that face foreign trained lawyers, yeah. that he would try his best to alleviate some of those headaches. So I think I appreciate him for that. And that's one of the reasons I came to Suji and Smith. You know, the kindness, the compassionate nature of this man called um, Charles Osuji. Um, so we are a general law firm. You know, we, we deal with all aspects of practice. Okay. And um, one of the unique things about us is that we try to ensure that we leave smiles on the faces of our clients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've uh, I've been a client for a long time. I know I know uh, Charles from way back in the day. So you're absolutely uh, uh, right. Certainly uh, an upgrade on the office yeah, so, from uh, from yeah, what we, I remember. We, we, we you know we used to be in Kensington. Well, yeah, that's we are still there, right? Yeah. But then we got this place. It's very unique. I always call it a palace. Also, the Smith Palace. Palace. Yeah. 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 Just out of curiosity, what are um, some of the uh, major headaches or barriers for um, uh, foreign trained lawyers immigrating into Canada that, that Charles and you guys have, have tried or, or are solving? Well, you know, and I will give you an example with my own experience, right? Yeah. When I came into Canada, and again, you know, the Canadian law space is such that, you know, even if you went to Harvard, <laughs> right? If you came into Canada, you must start afresh. That's the very unique thing about this country, right? Yeah. They, they want you to show them that you know what you're talking about. Yeah. All right. And um, that journey is not an easy one. It takes a while. Okay. Yeah. And um, so in the in the course of that journey, you need to be able to find law firms that can help you you know, keep you within the legal space, Yeah. all right? And that was, for example, one of the greatest challenges I had. I couldn't find such a thing. So Drew, when I came, I started by working at the Home Depot. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I worked in the Home Depot for three years, taking my exams. And in that three years, I wasn't within the legal community. So you can imagine how difficult it was for me. Those are parts of the things that Charles Osuji, by establishing FIDU, you know, is trying to remove. I, I look at our volunteers here in FIDU, and I am so, well, let me use the word jealous <laughs> of them, right? Because, yeah. you know, on a daily basis, and, you know, when they come, we involve them in all aspects of practice, from meeting the client, having a consult with the client, then developing the notes, getting them to do the work, getting them to do the research. In fact, before you know it, Drew, you yourself are feeling like a Canadian lawyer. Yeah. So when you are then going to face the exams, when you're going to face the articles, when you're going to face the CPLED exams, I'm telling you, you are fired up. You're prepared. Yes. Yeah. And you know why? Because the questions on the paper, they're, all they're asking you is, what have you been seeing in the law firm? Yeah. That's all. Yeah. So that is a huge thing that Charles Osuji, by establishing FIDU, you know, Foot in the Door Initiative, that is the very huge thing, the very huge mountain 
of, um, of, 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 of a challenge that he has removed. And I'm telling you, it is so beautiful. You know, my appreciation of Charles Osuji is not even because of the person he is. It is that he is not thinking of himself. He is thinking of the other person. Yeah. He's thinking of, he's like, love your neighbor like you love yourself. Yeah. Charles loves his neighbor more than he loves himself. Right? <laughs> good, it's a good yeah. philosophy that pays, yeah. right? It, it has returns to it yeah. more, more ways than one, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's interesting too, because just on that note, it has to be empowering in a multitude of ways, right? Like uh, you now get exposure right away. Mm -hmm. You're, you're um, like the pat, like you obviously got into law for a reason. So you're passionate about that. So yeah. to come to Canada and have to work at Home Depot it, just must, must be it, it was, um, hard mentally. Yes. But, but I, 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 I also am grateful for my experience yeah. at the Home Depot and, I, and I'm not trying to in any way, reduce the value of that experience to me, yeah. all right, or to my life, or to letting me know what living and existing in Canada is all about. Yeah, right? yeah. no, absolutely not, right? It doesn't, uh, it's, you're right, it's not meant to knock the yeah. experience, but you came here wanting to uh, uh, express and show a skill set that you yes. had, right? Yes. So it's nice that you've now got a pathway to yeah. do that. Do you, know, do, do you know that a lot of our volunteers when they are applying to other law firms, you know, to be picked or chosen for articles, yeah. once they see that you volunteered at Osuji and Smith Lawyers, oh man, that is like 70% of your acceptance. Comes with a lot of credibility. Right. That's good. Right. That's good. Right. You know, just ten, tangentially, right? So I, uh, in, in a former life, I was, I was a nurse, right? I was an eMERGE nurse. Oh, wow. And it was, it was a tough uh, time for, for a handful of colleagues of mine because uh, there's similar people that were in the exact same spot just in, in that profession, right? Like I had a gentleman who uh, was, a, was a good friend um, immigrating into Canada was a cardiologist in his home country mm. and uh, was had a tough time even getting into a nursing program here. So anything that that uh, helps establish sort of a, a better bridging program uh, so that uh, anybody from outside of the country can utilize their skills, I think is a huge asset and benefit. Very huge asset. Yeah. Very huge. So, okay, well, we've got a slew of questions to, to go through. Okay. Um, and I was thinking, why don't we start on the real estate side of things that sort of uh, works well with, with a number of the clients that, uh, that I've got, and we can kind of transition from there. Okay. But what types of legal issues do real estate lawyers typically handle? Well, um, so first of all, you want to be sure that um, when your client approaches you, um, a real estate transaction. Yeah. Okay. You want to look at the documents that um, you know come with that transaction. You want to look at the contract. You want to look at the terms of the contract. You want to look at you know whether this individual has qualified for financing. You want to look at when the opposing when the the lawyer on the other side writes to you. Are there trust conditions attached to the documents that are being sent to you? For example, um, there might be an inspection of the property, okay? And this hasn't been done or that hasn't been done. There is what we call hold back, yep. right? And so a hold back is the other lawyer saying, look, this hasn't been done and that hasn't been done, okay? We would want you to hold back $10,000, for example, you know, for the repair of such a thing, okay? And so we are, we are going to release the funds to you on the trust condition that you do that hold back, okay? And so, I, I, and of course, the lawyer would say, if you're not able to meet with these trust conditions, you know, please either keep those documents with you and do not do anything with them, all right? Uh -huh. And then you find situations also where, um, and this happens to me too, right? We went and inspected the property we were to be in. Yeah. And 
you know, one of the floors, a part of the floor, they had put a rug over it. Okay. And, okay. And so, I know where this is going. Yeah. And so, you know, <coughs> they had put a rug over some damage mm -hmm. on the floor. Right. So we inspected the property and it looked okay. Right. It looked beautiful and everything. And then we signed everything and stuff like that, you know. And so when we now got professional cleaners to clean out the place, one of them pulled off the rug and there was this great damage. But by then we had signed documents. We had, you know, money had exchanged hands and stuff like that. Okay. So we had to start going through the process. And this is what I always advise my clients. Before you call Chuck and say, oh, Chuck, wow, we are in El Dorado. Please. <laughs> Please do be sure that, look, we've seen this house, we've gone through it, everything is okay, all right? And so um, you're ready to, to, for the ball to roll, okay? Yeah. Because it's always a difficult thing you, um, when after all the, after everything is said to be okay, and then they are now, we, we now see an obstacle. Yeah, once the yeah. transaction's been yeah, processed, it's, it's hard. It's hard to go back and get the money. It's hard to get back and get the money. Yeah. And another thing is this: so clients come and say, "I'm going to go to court. I'm going to go to court." And I say to them, "Well, you know, um, going to court is time plus x. Yeah. It is one dollar times x. All right. And so you need to also." There is what is called in law contributory negligence, right? So, okay, fine. The, 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 the sellers were negligent, right? But you, who went and saw, so it's not like it was a transaction done in secret. You who went and saw this thing, what of you, right? So there's a, there's a negligent contribution from your part. So you need to think about that. Another thing, Drew, is this. Most times, um, real estate transactions. So you find a situation where it is said by 12 noon, we're handing over the keys. keys. Yep. Right? Yep. We're handing over the keys. And then at exactly 11.55, there is a problem. How often does that happen? Man, that happens. Really? <laughs> yeah, that happens. <laughs> that happens, right? So there is a problem and you're, you know, you're reaching out to the other lawyer and you're saying, look, this has just happened, right? We, this thing cannot happen by 12, right? And so the other lawyer then writes back to you and says, well, there will be interest <coughs> accruing. Yeah. There will be interest accruing. I remember one of the deals that we, we handled and the opposing counsel, we, we were sellers and, you know, he represented the buyers and then the, and this issue came up. Right, and so this thing did not close until the next day. So we have to calculate interest per diem, right, per day, right? Yeah, and and put it on all of that. Okay. Now, just on, just sort of interrupt. But yeah. when you when you calculate interest, is it simply just to recover a cost, or is there a penalty uh, associated with it? Who uh, for whoever is holding up the process? Yes, there, there are penalties. Yeah, but even the penalties is also in that um, recovering some cost. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Because um, I remember one of the transactions that we handled, we were for the purchasers, right? And so there, there was a problem from the buyers and from the seller's side. Yeah. Okay. And my client had packed his things. He came from Saskatoon, packed his things in um, what's it called? This truck hauling um, or oh, what are they called? Um, U-Haul. U-Haul. Yeah. Okay. Packed his things, and you know, so what was anticipated was that immediately he came in. Well, he's moving, they're giving him the keys at 12 and he's moving in and stuff like that. So right? 11.55 rolls around and he now has to Man, sleep and, in his U-Haul yes, truck? Right. So, <laughs> so that became the problem. An issue, so, yeah. Yes. So, and this didn't materialize until the next day. Yeah. So he had to incur hotel costs and all of that. And so we were, we were letting the, um, the opposing counsel know 
Look at what's happened, right? We sent him the hotel, whatever, uh, the, the um, receipts and everything. And we said, look, you know, there needs to be a hold back of this amount, yeah. right? And, and then let's talk about recouping all that, you know, no way. Luckily, the guy said, okay, I'm not, don't worry about the inconvenience, but money I've spent. I'll, I should be able to yeah, have back. Yeah, 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 that's fair. Right. Yeah. So those are some of the problems that, um, you know, we, we see um, in real estate too. And, um, and, you know, when these issues are happening, it's per minute, per minute, per minute. So you're not even at rest. I'm yeah. telling you, like, you are, the other lawyer is writing, you're writing, the other lawyer, you're, you're going to your real estate team, what's happening? You're, There's always a sense of urgency. You're calling the client. The, yeah. The client, oh, wow. It's... Uh, <laughs> But you know, um, when these transactions fall through, yeah, and the client the client sees how much you have committed to ensuring that his position is protected, I think that essentially that's what a CD and Smith is about. You know? Yeah, letting the client the client sees your the efforts that you've put yeah, in, your yeah, your commitment to ensuring yeah. that their that their rights are protected. So I, I want to talk about negligence in a moment because yeah. uh, I think that's sort of a good uh, lead into another topic. Yeah. But for a new home buyer or a realtor or even just a, a regular home buyer, is yeah. there uh, certain things that you would advise that they do to prevent these headaches uh, from even occurring? Okay. Um, so, you know, um, one of the things, so it's not everything that is in the, jurisdiction of the lawyer yeah so well, true yes so true it's, it's, it's not everything that is in the jurisdiction of the lawyer so so some of these problems are problems that arise outside of the lawyer yeah okay but again and i'm not boosting here but because we're osuji and smith, you boast man boast of what? <laughs> <laughs> but because we're osuji and smith right yeah what we try to do is we we think outside of the box yeah okay we think outside of the box so i i i call my i call the realtor and i sit with the realtor i say look um this transaction what what is your forecast about it? Are there any issues likely to arise? Um, these people have they gotten approval? Have they been financed? Right? Is is there any problem going to arise from the finance person? And I call the clients. I say, look, who is your who is your mod, who who are you going to for financing? Is there any person we can speak with? All yeah. right. And then we call the person. Those are not the lawyer's duties. No, no, right. and that's something part of your practice that you guys just do. That is what we have developed in Osuji and Smith, yeah. right? We call the financiers. We say, look, um, we represent these individuals. Um, do you people see any problems with, with you know, this financial thing coming up, right? And then we discuss with them, and they say, well, no, um, you know, this and this and that, right? And then I go back to the realtor. I say, look, have you seen this house? Have you looked at it? Okay. I call the client and then I say, look, um, when, 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 you, when you are ready to buy this place, do you have anybody who is a professional inspector? Somebody who will go and inspect this property and let us know what the state of this property really is. Do you have such a thing? And then, oh, yes, we have this. Uh, or if you don't have, there are people we use. Yeah. Right? We can call them. We can arrange with the other lawyer, uh, the realtor on the other side. The, the, the inspector can go and look at the place. All right? So, so we, we think outside of the box. But we try to as much as possible. And it's not possible to be 100%, right? But, you know, if you as much as do 90%, Right. Yeah. Well, I think you're just you're yeah. emphasizing that there's a couple of additional steps yes. that can really help to mitigate risk right. and also provide and good service. Good, right? And, and, and provide good service, right? Yeah. And then prepare everybody's minds. Yeah, I think the preparing everybody's minds is a really good point. I mean, uh, we uh, I do doc reviews too, not from a legal perspective, right. but uh, reviewing of the finance to try and 
you know, evaluate the quality of the asset, right? And you're absolutely right. There's there's a, a lot that you can do, uh, just small bits of information uh, that you can give that really adds a ton of value or by making a, a couple extra calls Good. really helps right. solve and, and any so issues, let, right? Let me tell you one more thing. So when you come to us and when you say, Chuck, I've seen this property and I'd like to buy it. Yeah. All right. We get the address. We get the owner's receipt. We do what is called a land title search. Yeah. We look at, so when we get the land title certificate, we look at encumbrances, you know, um, registered encumbrances against title. We look at the easements. We look at, you know, are there secondary finances on this thing? Are there lines of credit? Are there home line warranty loans and all of that? We look at all those things. And we call the client. And we say, hey, look, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. All right? And well, usually, when these transactions take place, the first things that are paid out yeah. are all those registered improvements. Yeah. Right? But you need to bring that to the attention of the client also. So that he doesn't think he's walking into El Dorado. <laughs> yes. yeah. He knows that look, um, there are these problems on this, this title, right? Uh -huh. But we also want to be sure that the individual who wants to pass title to us is the owner. Yeah. That it's his name on that document. Yeah, because you're and and you're you're there's a couple of critical ones, right? Yeah. The one that you mentioned, and then you also I assume pull an estoppel certificate, right? right? That's another critical yeah. one, right? You know, so you know you, you want to be sure that the person is the owner, and if you see two names on the title certificate, then you know that perhaps it's husband and wife, perhaps they are co-owners, you know, no no marital relationship, maybe two friends who bought a property. All yeah. right, so when the documents are coming to you, you need to be sure that those two names are represented yeah. on all those documents. So okay. that's that's the title. Yeah. Do you mind just describing a little bit about the importance of the estoppel certificate and then any other relevant documents uh, involved in a real estate transaction? Yes, so um, sometimes, you know, the... The, these transactions, right, um, in order to protect both the buyer and the seller, right, yeah. there needs to be mechanisms put in place, right, to ensure that, you know, if any, um, if any warranties, if any, um, of, um, if any promises are made, if any if there are any agreements, right, protecting the rights of the parties are reached, right, that, you know, one of the parties does not now, um, you know, go back, right, on, on that promise or on that agreement. Yeah, they're not right, reneging. Right. Yes, yeah. you can renege yeah. on what you have, right? Yeah. And so when an estopel certificate is issued, it is issued to ensure that, you know, and that certificate will contain terms to the effect that, hey, if you go against this, if any one of you reneges, because Drew, a contract, when people enter into a contract, they have adjusted their positions. Yes. Based on a certain set of facts. Yeah. So when, when I've adjusted my position, and then you then adjust yours based on what we have agreed. There must be some safeguards. Okay. There must be some provisions that say, well, if this happens, then, you know, this is going to happen. Okay. The only problem is, is that most times, People just want to stubbornly stick to their rights. <laughs> okay. And then it, it, it begins to go into litigation. Yeah. Drew, I, for no reason would I accept as a last resort litigation, right? Yeah. So people should, people should go into agreements. There's, there's this thing in law 
agreements must be kept. Pacta sum servanda. That's the Latin phrase. Agreements must be kept. So this estopel certificates also would help to, uh, to let you know that, look, you know, we've both adjusted our positions. And in the event that any one of us reneges on this thing, then, of course, this is what, you know, is going to happen. It's going to happen, yeah. Right. Yeah. Are there any other critical uh, documents that, that create that backup? Um, well, you know, most times, too, and sometimes in... In this um, in this sale and purchase agreement, right? Yeah. There are there are sections of it, right? That let you know that you know if if and this is one thing we do too, right? When we get the sale contracts or when we get the um, transaction contracts, we go through it with the clients. Yeah. Right. We don't assume. I, I don't like asking clients, "Have you read this?" I don't like it. I yeah. will bring you in, sit you down, and we will go through it together. And then I will show you any penalty clauses. Because part of your function is to summarize that critical material, yes. and they might also be looking at a document that they don't fully understand. Good, right? good. So, so yeah. you need to explain what these wordings are to them, right? You need to let them know and say, look, hey, you know, this thing says that if um, you have inspected this place, and you don't raise any issues, right, within this number of days. If we sign the document and money changes hands, yeah. you know, if you come back to chalk, then just know that the next thing we are doing is that we are going to court. <laughs> Fair enough. Right? Yeah. We are going to court. And one of the things the judge might ask is, were you deceived? You know, did you enter... Were you hoodwinked? Um, was a gun put to your head? You know, like because you're looking at an adult. Yeah. And 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 you're asking how how did you do this? Right? You got into this contract. You know, you signed it. Uh, a client came to me some time ago and said um, that he would like me to go to court to uh, apply to rescind the terms of the contract. And I'm like, okay, is this your signature? Yes. All right. Um, he said he didn't get legal advice. I said, okay, the person you signed it with, did, did he get legal advice? He said, well, no. I said, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so both of you are in the same boat, right? So yeah. it's really going to be difficult, you know, except we can prove fraud, deceit, and all of those um, other items. So let, let's talk a little bit about, like, the deceit and the negligence component of right. it, right? So... What, uh, so just as a, as a new home buyer that, so not a first time home buyer, but you're, you're purchasing a property, the issue that you had with uh, the carpet and yeah, the flooring. Right. How does the law define negligence or how would you, how would you as a lawyer go, okay, you know what, someone has a legitimate issue here or the onus is on the person or the onus is actually on the person who purchased the property. You should have looked at this. Like what? What's, is there a fine line? So, Drew, let me say this first of all. Yeah. And using my example, all right? Um, in the first place, there was knowledge yeah. on the part of the seller that there was that problem. True, yeah. There was knowledge. Yeah. Secondly, it was the seller's obligation you know, um, the, the law is that a plaintiff must prove his case and not rely on the witness of the defense. Gotcha. So, this, this guy, the seller knows, oh, there is a problem. He did not bring it to the attention of the realtor. Again, perhaps the realtor knew too, mm -hmm. right? He did not bring it to the attention of the realtor. And then they decided that they would take steps to what? To conceal. Right. They would take steps to conceal that problem. And they concealed it. 
And when you're talking about carpet, like, like it's not someone threw a rug over, like someone laid carpet down. Like this. A... Oh, okay. Oh, oh. So it is something like that. They like just, that. They you know, literally. It wasn't. Um, and, and even though it was like that, right? It wasn't like stuck to the floor. Yeah. Right. It wasn't like stuck to the floor, and it was in an inconsequential part of the house. It was in the laundry room. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah. It was in the laundry room, right? So, but I, I am, I am now telling you about awareness. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it is that awareness component that necessarily leads to the factor of deceit. Right. And so the the, the seller knew that there was that problem. Did not bring it to the attention of the realtor or or, or, the, or the buyer. Did. Yeah. Or maybe did right. Fair. Fair. Did not also call the buyer's attention to it. So so the buyer, you should not then rely on, oh, you know, after all, you went and inspected the house, right? You should ask yourself, first of all, did I know, was the act of concealment deliberate? And you can't tell me it wasn't deliberate. Because if you had knowledge of a problem and you concealed it, what was your intention? Yeah, and it, it's hard. You're hard pressed to have uh, the owner say, "Well, the carpet was there when right. I bought it." <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so the concept of negligence here is even more on the part of the seller than it is on the part of the buyer, because first of all, there would not have been a problem if there was no problem. Yeah. Now there was a problem. The seller knew there was a problem hoped that the buyer wouldn't see the problem. I mean, if, if that's not the highest level of deceit, I, I don't know. Don't know what it's, yeah. I don't yeah. know what it's. Chuck, right. you're so passionate. I feel, I feel like we need to, like, add a separate thing. We need to we need to create, like, a, 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 a spin-off episode of Suits and uh, and, and have our own anytime, lawyer show. Yeah. Chuck is in, anytime. <laughs> I, I, I love the public space. Yeah. You know, I, I like letting people know that they shouldn't just sit down and fold their hands. Yeah. Okay. I, I just, I, 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 and that is one, one thing. That's one of the reasons why I tell you, Drew, that's one of the reasons why I came to Suki and Suites. You know, and, and I'm sorry that I keep talking about Charles with Suki. It's okay. You can plug as you go. Yes. Don't worry about but, it. But, you know, Charles with Suji, all he has done is built this thing. But he lets you be you. He lets you bring your character. He lets you bring your ability to fight, to believe in yeah. the strength of your client's case. He lets you bring it into your work. He doesn't move out above you. No. No. He calls you and says, what do you think? Freedom within some boundaries, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's, and and, yeah. and that's, the good, that, that's the good thing about working here. You know, Charles likes... He likes people to bring their individualism into the solving of clients' problems, right? So okay, so onto onto clients' problems yeah. and back onto the negligence thing. If we now think about or frame that that term in the context of uh, condos, townhomes, yeah. how do bylaws and how is negligence defined? Uh, uh, sort of defined in in that arena. Is it the same? Is it different? And I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a good example okay. here. So during the winter seasons, we have uh, there's people that are in buildings that like to sleep with a window open mm -hmm. that then freezes a pipe. Right. That as soon as that uh, um, uh, there's a thaw, the pipe bursts. There's a there's an issue, right? Um, or people will leave on vacation yeah. and there's an incident that arises from their unit causing damage yeah. to others. What, what determines negligence in those types of cases? Okay. Do let me, let me, let me um, now that we are talking about condominiums, right? Yeah. Um, I would like to draw your attention to three documents. The first one is the condominium corporation act. Yeah. The second one is the condominium corporation regulation. The third one is the bylaw. Well, the fourth one is rules. Okay. Okay. So the first two are legislations of well of of, of the province of the province, yeah. right? The 
Third one, the bylaw, is do's and don'ts of a corporation managing a condominium property. The fourth one, rules, are rules that have been promulgated by the board. Yeah. So, so the bylaw is by the corporation. The rules are by the board. Okay? Now, when you apply to have a share in the in the in the common factor of the corporation. So it's like shares, right? But they're yeah. common, common factors of the corporation. When you apply and it is approved and you get your mortgage and buy a condominium space, by law, you should be given a bylaw. Yeah. You should be given a bylaw. Now it is not the it is not the duty of the board of the corporation to give the bylaw to you. <laughs> no, 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 it's your duty. Yes, it's, it's your duty to read the bylaw, find out what because upon that document being handed to you, it's like you know your phones when you want to get an app or get something, they say agree or not agree. Yeah, this is your acknowledgement that you will follow. And this. the law, the courts have held that that I agree. Yeah, uh, is. Is, is is binding on you. Yeah. Okay, good. So when when the bylaw is handed to you, that is your I agree. You cannot come later and say, Oh, I didn't know this was provided in it. All right. They should not even tell you go and seek legal advice. It's not a you people are not in contention. So when you get the bylaw. The bylaws provide for, there is a corporation, a condominium corporation that I'm, I'm reviewing their bylaw right now. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. And one of the things I've put in there is that your, this bylaw being given to you is your consent to, uh, and your acknowledgement of having read, having understood, and having agreed to be bound. By the Bible. So do in this Bible, there are there are provisions for, you know, um, so, so some of the bylaws refer to rules. So the rules would then say, perhaps if you're living in winter, do this, do that. If you're if this is, you know, setting out how to take care of common properties. Right. Under the Condominium Property Co um, Act 2, there is a provision for the board, for the Condominium Corporation to levy um, 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 fines. Thank yep. you. Yep. To levy fines, right? Yep. Uh -huh. There is also a provision for the Condominium Corporation to you know, meet and take um, decisions affecting any unit Right, so if if your unit, if the way you have lived in your unit has led to the damages of common property, right? Yeah. So so whatever is in your unit is your property. Yep. But but if there is a line, a silver line running wherever, and as a result of you keeping whatever open, the silver line busts, that is on you. You have to repair it. You have to make sure that so the condominium corporation would then be on you. And then again, that imports the concept of negligence, right? Because, you know, if you, you know, Drew, you, 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 we live in Canada, okay? Yeah. And except if I came in today as, as, um, as an immigrant, if I came in today in winter, I would not be knowledgeable yeah. about the effect of winter and all that. I, I remember when I, I came, I came to Canada in March of 2013. Okay. And cut, I was dressed cut the tail end. No, I was dressed like you. Yeah. I was dressed like you. I, I hadn't been in snow before mm -hmm. or whatever. So I just took my bags and walked out of the airport. 
and then the cold enveloped me. Oh my God, I ran back. <laughs> no, I ran back. <laughs> I'm sorry, but... I, I like the cold enveloping me. There's a cold day outside. Yes, this is me. So. I ran back into yeah. the airport. So, except yeah. you say, yeah. well, I'm just an immigrant who is coming now. I don't know. You know, there is general knowledge about what happens in winter. Yes. About the effect of of winter on on materials on things right so what you've done is not is not wear and tear that's correct it's not it's it's that you've deliberately done something to damage right so that is negligence that is negligence on your part for which you should pay and is is this was is what you're saying that the bylaws at least have to acknowledge or define what was is negligence or is that already no, defined in that's defined in other legislation for example gotcha. right yeah. but that definition would properly suit the action that the individual has done right and and just on the on the thought of common property damage yeah. um that doesn't have to be a physical damage. Someone uh, like the the condo corporation could suffer a just a fiscal loss in something. So there's a good example that uh, that I had arise uh, a while back, and that was one of utility costs. Okay. So it's a smaller property, and utility costs for are paid for by the the condo fees, okay. right? But an individual in one unit had a running toilet never stopped okay. uh, for a period of time, ended up tripling the condo fee, uh, the, the utility cost for that property. Mm -hmm. Is that something that the board could consider, uh, could consider as negligent and or a, like a common property damage? Well, okay, so, so let's segmentalize this issue now, right? Love it, let's do it. Good. So um, first of all, the toilet is in his unit. Right, and um, there are some condominium corporations that have a way of so they have meters, for example, that register the usage of water. Right, so the the water coming into the into the condominium is general water, right? But the water going to each unit. Yep. now becomes the property of that unit, right? So if this unit had used in excess, okay, the meter that is set up against that unit should then be able to, to show that this individual has used water to that excess amount. And so sometimes when utility bills come out for these units, yeah. like for example, water, it should register against that unit. It should not, you know, so if, if for example, the, the water for the entire building is, for example, 10 liters, and this individual has used two liters as a result of his running toilet, okay, then that meter should show that the two liters was used by this place and not by Drews or any other person's apartment, right? Yeah. It should show, okay? So when things come into the corporation, it is common. But when it goes directly to any unit, it then becomes the property of that unit. Right. For which that unit owner should pay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess more of a challenging uh, issue if uh, the property is built on with a single meter. Well, if the right. property is built with a single meter, right? Yeah. Then it, if if the if the corporation notices that the <clears throat> excuse me, if the corporation sees that oh we are going above these ten meters that we've yeah. been at the right, yeah. they begin to trace and say oh. What's, what's this, what has happened? The cause, yeah. The cause of it, right? And they, they find out that a unit has used, right? A, it has a faulty toilet and all of that, right? Um, it, is their, it is their right to call the attention, okay? And then to 
to then say, okay, because of this and that, right? This is what you're going to pay in addition. Right. Okay. This is what you're going to pay in addition. And you know, it, it's and so that unit owner doesn't uh, doesn't have a, a good position, or is is probably not correct if they say, "Well, I pay utility costs. This no, is just my utility no, cost." No, you you see you you are also bound not only by the bylaws but the act and the regulation okay. to ensure that your the private properties consistent in your unit are functioning properly. Gotcha. And not to let it fall into disrepair in such a way that it begins to affect the rights of the other people. Yeah. You, you understand? I understand. Uh -huh. yeah. In such a way that you begin to... It be, so you can't say, oh, you know, uh, this is in my property. Well, it's in your property, but what's happening in your property is now beginning to go outside. Yeah. Right? To affect the quiet and peaceable enjoyment of others of their own rights, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and again, let me say this. Under the law, under the uh, Condominium Corporation Act, if, if the corporation levies you and you don't pay it, in a general meeting or in a meeting convening for you guys to vote, yeah. if you haven't paid that thing, 60 days prior to that meeting, you will not vote. If you send a proxy, the proxy will not vote. So you've, you've sort of take you've lost your power. You've lost your power yeah. to vote. Yeah, to vote. Yeah, to vote. Yeah. 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 Still have other powers. You, yeah. you can attend, but you can vote. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, just on this, on this general theme, yeah. what then about the, and, and we're talking about disclosure, negligence, what about documentation? If we could just maybe circle back to that a little bit again. So when you go to purchase a property, yeah. there's a list of, of documents that you can obviously request to have reviewed and looked at, right? That a unit, uh, per, a, a prospective buyer can, yeah. can have looked at. What, uh, but, but at times there is not a formal or a complete uh, document. So something might be in a draft form mm -hmm. or not approved by the condo board. What obligation do they have or does the uh, condo management company have to divulge that information or provide that information if it's not formalized? Well, um, so, so let's, let me take a bylaw for example. Sure, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's take a bylaw. It is the prerogative of the board to, to vote amongst themselves for the bylaw to be amended, for it to be repealed. So that's personal. That's the board, right? Yep. After that, if there is, like the, the bylaws I'm amending now, right, for a certain board, right? After this amendment, I send it to the board, and then the board reviews it. They point out this, point out that, point out this. Send, they send me their questions. I have a meeting with the board, and then I explain. I say to them, oh, section these of the Condominium Corporations Act, you did or did that, right? And so I, in all of that back and forth, it has nothing to do with the owners. Okay. In all of that back and forth, it has nothing to do with the owners. Now, the condominium board and I agree, finally, is a document is brought up. You see, at the stage of all of that drafting, you, you can't give it to an owner. Yeah. No, you can't, right? At the stage of all of that drafting, when it is ready and the board sees it is ready, the board can then call a special meeting. Okay. Now, before that meeting is called, this document drafted by Chuck, agreed to by the board, is sent to all the owners. And then, 
when that document is sent to the owners, the, the, the owners will be told, oh, we've amended the bylaw. This is a copy of the amended bylaw. It hasn't become legal yet. It will only become legal when it is passed in a meeting called for that purpose and it will be by special resolution of the members. Now, and I, and I will tell you the significant thing here. The difference between special resolution and ordinary resolution, resolution yep. is that in an ordinary resolution, majority of people present passes something. Okay. In a special resolution, when it comes to the bylaw, 75% of the people present must vote to pass that bylaw. But it, um, it's not just people present though, right? It, it, it's 75% uh, present or not. No, so, so when you are voting, well, you know, the law provides that you can vote by electronic means. Yes, yeah. The law also provides that those ca calling in or on camera are deemed to be present. Right, but when you, when you go to uh, uh, pass a set of bylaws, mm -hmm. um, uh, you, if you hold a, a, uh, like a town hall mm -hmm. to have them passed, yeah. right? And that is, then that gives everybody uh, an availability to be there. If 75% of mm -hmm. the people that are in the room and or on phone yeah. or uh, that, um, uh, via Zoom, let's say, right. if that doesn't constitute 75% of, of the total unit factors in the total building, those bylaws can't be passed. That's not true. No? No, that's not true. You see, I can send you a notice to attend a meeting. Okay. I can't compel you to come. Okay. I can't also compel you to send a proxy. All right? Yeah. So the, the law considers these things. So the law says 75% of those present, not those, not 75% of the unit owners. But but bylaws say mm -hmm. that, and it, so does the act. Any, any bylaw that provides that, and, and you see, this is where the lawyers come in. Okay. This is where the lawyers come in. Any bylaw that provides that, any bylaw that is inconsistent with the terms of either the act or the regulation is void. Any bylaw, the terms, if, if there is a section 35 in the bylaw, and it is inconsistent with any of the terms of the act or yeah. the resolution, it is void. If the condominium corporation, the, if the board makes a rule, you know, I have defined rule, this um, um, uh, uh, um, act, regulation, bylaw, rule. If the board makes a rule that is inconsistent with the bylaw, the rule is void. If the corporation makes a bylaw that is inconsistent with the act or the regulation, the bylaw is void. So any bylaw that says that, that the entire unit members must be present, that bylaw is void. Why? Because the law, the Condominium Property Act says 75%, it is well-defined. It, it's it's 75, it's well-defined as 75% Total unit factors and total no, uh, percentage. No, seventy-five percent of the the those present and voting. Seventy-five okay. percent of those present. Chuck, we we may have opened up a Pandora's box here. I'm gonna I'm gonna want to know this one a little bit more yes, and dig into uh, it. I, I, I use, um, Joshua. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. No, let's... <laughs> Let, I, I could just get the law for you and read it out directly. Sure. Well, okay. Well, we'll, yeah. move, we'll move on. But yes, I am so curious <laughs> yeah, okay. about this one now. Sure. So curious. <laughs> um, how about uh, for new homes that right. are built and new condos um, and warranty related issues? Have you ever dealt with uh, concerns or any litigation around new warranty or warrantable issues? Now, um, 
Incidentally, there is this legislation that it's called the New Home Warranty Act. Mm -hmm. All right, so it provides for um, incidences or things that those who are buying new homes, right, are entitled to. So there are some warranties, right, that come with, you know, the fact that somebody's a new home buyer, you know. Um, and I go back to that example of me buying a home, and, you know, right. So um, under the new home warranty, the new home buyer's warranty act, right, things like that will be talked about. That you don't deliberately deceive somebody who is a new home buyer. There are warranties. There are sections that speak to one. You are you are assuring this new home buyer that you have the legal capacity and the legal right to do what you are doing. You are assuring this new home buyer that look. You know, when I say this house is has this number of columns or that number of that, that that is what it has. You are assuring this new home buyer that, you know, um, this wall that I've set up is built to last 15 years. Yeah, okay. Right? And stuff like that. So there are assurances in that act. For which, if it is discovered that those assurances are not true, then there are um, there are penalties. Yeah. Okay. There are penalties. Okay. So so um, when a new home buyer is coming to to present himself to enter into a transaction with you, you need to know that you as the, you know, the person, the condominium, well, first of all, let's even take a situation where, well, the land has been acquired. Okay. The developer starts to develop, right? And um, when the developer registers the plan with the land titles, the registrar of land titles, right? The, regist the developer is meant to um, constitute an interim board. An interim board. That board will be changed after the, 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 the place has been developed, okay? And they have a bylaw and the bylaw is registered, okay? That board will be changed after that because then, then they have to hold what is called an annual general meeting. All right, that board will be registered. So when the developer is developing and after developing, people begin to come to show interest in that, that condominium property, right? Mm -hmm. The developer the, is under an obligation, full disclosure, Drew, under an obligation to let you know the specifics of this thing. You know, this is how we've built it. These are the materials that we've used. In essence, he is warranting that, look, I have built this thing to Canadian, um, 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 oh, what's that word? I'm sorry. It, to, to Canadian building standards. Ah, to code. Yes. Yeah. To code. Yeah. Right? I've built it to code. All the materials I've used. Because, man, if I buy a, a condominium property and within two weeks, right, the wires are burning up inside of this thing, yeah. right? And, I mean, and the problem here is at the end of the day, you might have to go to court to protect your rights, right? Yeah. But there is a legislation that protects you as a new one. There is a legislation that protects you as a new home buyer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Why don't we take a break there?
back from our break, took a few minutes um, uh, just to top up our coffees and more importantly, to actually get documents because uh, I am very curious on this, this passing of bylaws. Yeah. So, Chuck, walk us through. Okay. So, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to give you a real life example. Please do. Good. So Chuck is um, Chuck is approached by Drew, who is a member of the board of a of a the board of a condominium corporation. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, Drew says, Chuck, you know, we want to amend our bylaws. And I say, okay, is there an existing bylaw? He says, yes. So give it to me. And. Um, and so one of my <clears throat> one of my obligations is that because it's there in the law, the condominium property act, that these bylaws must be amended along the terms of <coughs> excuse me, I don't know what <coughs> excuse me, sorry. The the bylaws must be amended along the terms of the condominium property act. Okay. And the terms of the condominium property regulation. Okay. So I take the, the one you give, give, you've given to me, and I look at it, and I go to the property, condominium property act. I pull up the condominium property regulation, and then I begin to amend. At that stage, the unit owners are not in. Correct. Yeah, and we summarized that. Before, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is the board and Chuck. Yeah. So I do the first draft. I send to the board. The board looked through, they note their questions and stuff like that. They return it back to Chuck. Chuck does the amendments. And then, so, so what I normally do is after I do the second amendment, I then have a video conference. Either I have a video conference with the board or they give me a date and place where I can come and meet them. And then, you know, we look at, you know, um, the, the current one I'm, I'm amending, one of the members delineated a certain part that had to do with external walls and this and this and that and said, he said it wasn't um, it wasn't um, provided. Uh, it, it wasn't a part of the condominium, whatever, what uh, corporations um, obligation, right? Okay. So I drew their attention to the provisions of the new home buyers warranty, to the definition section, and I showed them there that, that and that's why I said to you that. That is an act that also affects the Condominium Property Act and the regulation. Okay? okay. So I satisfy that. So along the process of amending, I meet with the board. I answer questions. When we now agree, the board and Chuck, when we now agree and say, okay, we're now ready. Okay? To pass the bylaws or to try and pass them. We are now ready. Okay. We're now ready. Okay. We're now ready. To present it to the owners. Present, okay. Um, Mr. Secretary of the Board, issue notices to the board members, issue forms, you know, and these forms should contain proxy forms. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Issue notices, tell them that we are convening a meeting on so 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 day at so 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 time at so 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 place okay this is what we are going to discuss please find attached a proxy form in the event that you will not be present you can send the proxy you can also call in by telephone or by any other electronic means please find below the numbers that you can call into we will also be a, there will also be an opportunity to appear by Zoom. Look at the link. Okay. 
So you're trying to provide as much access as possible. As possible. Right? Yeah. As possible. Okay. So, on that day, let's say it's Saturday today. All right? Yeah. Is that meeting properly convened? Yes, it is. Because the board has followed all the requisites for ensuring that a meeting is properly convened. Okay. Everybody has received the notice. Drew, the board cannot be held responsible if you decide not to come, if you decide not to send a proxy. Or if you haven't kept your contact information up to date. To date. To date. Yeah. Or if the board had earlier issued a oh, what's the word a penalty against you, yeah, and then you didn't pay sixty days to the convening of that meeting, you didn't pay, yeah, okay, then you can't vote, you can attend, okay, but you will not vote. And if you send a proxy, the proxy will not vote because a proxy is you, right, right, good. Yeah. It will be stated in that notice that the reason why we're calling this meeting is to be able to review and pass by special resolution the amended bylaw. On that day, Drew, if five people come, the meeting is properly convened. Man, okay, okay. The meeting is yeah. properly convened. Okay. Which is different from, is there a forum? Okay. Is there a forum? So, and I'm going to read out. So, so when that meeting is convened and people arrive, unit owners or proxies, and they arrive, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is a special resolution meeting, that bylaw cannot become effective except it is passed by 75%. And if, if you had, if you remember earlier, I had drawn your attention to the difference between an ordinary resolution and a special. So ordinary majority carries the day. Okay. But special, that majority must be not less than 75%. Of, of votes and unit factors? Of those present. Right. But, but so, so, but those. And, and those present include those who are on electronic meet. Abs absolutely. But. Drew, but no pedestrian <laughs> will attend that meeting. So no, no, when, no. When that's, you not, say, that's not what I'm asking, right? So. Uh, but if you read that bylaw, though, there's two there's two pieces that need to be satiated, yes. uh, satiated right? right? Seventy five percent unit factor and Listen, seventy. And I have it here in front of you. Yeah, please, me. please. It says special resolution means a resolution passed. Yep. At a properly convened meeting. Okay. Of a corporation by a majority of not less than seventy five percent of all the persons entitled to exercise the powers of voting conferred by this act or the bylaws and not and representing not less than 75% of the total unit factors for all the units okay so if a unit owner attends mm -hmm. that is one another unit owner attends that is two. Another unit owner attends. That is three. Okay. Right? 75%. Because everybody who attends, either personally or by proxy, is a unit owner. Correct. So right? that, that then satiates one of the two variables, mm -hmm. right? The next one is, like those three people that comprise 75% right. might not hold 75% of the unit factors that are in that room. That is why we talk of quorum. Okay. That is why we bring in quorum, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That is why we bring in quorum. So if, if Drew comes 
and Drew has um, maybe 15%, right? Uh, so but, 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 but hold on. Yeah. L- let's even talk about, let's approach it from your argument. Okay. Right? Let's approach it from your argument. Yeah. Supposing Drew has 40% unique factor. Correct. Yes. Okay. And Vincent has um, 40% unique factors. Two of you then become 80%. That's right. And so the question then arises, if there are 17 people meant to constitute a quorum, will that thing pass just because two of you attended only? And two of you constitute more than 75%. And the answer is no. Right? It will not. Because you need 75 Right. But but so my point is is in the reverse as well. If 75% of the people um, vote in favor of it, but Vincent and I do not, and we constitute 80% of the unit factors, it too does not pass. One thing, one one thing I've seen in my experience, Drew, is this that um, these unit factors mm-hmm. are equally divided. But they're right? so 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 they they are so you're right. There is a very narrow range in how yes, they're divided. But right. if you if you look at a lot of larger buildings now, you will have a business ownership that will say that will purchase say 30 units in a building. And now all of, or even even more so on new builds, the developer might incorporate a new company and would hold a, 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 a large number of units that they then rent out. Yes, but but Drew, yeah. If if you hold like 60 units, mm-hmm. each unit is one. It's just that collectively, you hold 60. So, so when, and I'll give you an example. Okay. When a developer approaches the registrar of land titles, oh, I have land, I want to register it. Mm-hmm. He is given a composite certificate. Composite, you know, a, 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 a whole certificate to show that he owns this land. Okay. When he develops that property into condominium um, sections, right? Okay. He will go back to the registrar who will cancel that his composite certificate. Okay. And then issue a certificate of title to each condominium owner. Okay. Issue a certificate. So when you go as a business, and you buy 40 units, you will have a certificate of title for each of your units. Correct. Okay. 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 So I'm with you. Right. So when as a result of you buying 40 units, right? You you then own you don't you then own um um 75% of the, I see. Okay. Yes, I see. I, I it so, clicked for me now where right. the mistake was so, in, in what I'm saying. So yep. if if we then and I'm, and I'm approaching it from your uh, your yep. your argument. No, it's right? it's right. Okay. Right. So, so so we then call a meeting, and and, it, um, and when we call a meeting, yeah, we, we say there are how many of us now? There are four of us, right? Yeah, calling the meeting. But I'm then I've got you forty got, units or six, so I am. One times. If we follow your argument, right? I get you. Because now. Yep. what you're yep. then saying is that three of us. <laughs> your right? That's right. That's All right. right. Okay. okay. So I'm with you. Yes. Now, when seventy five percent agree, yeah, they say okay, we now pass this. The bylaw has been passed by special resolution. Now to the next step. It will be presented to the registrar. Yes, of okay. Land title, who will register it and then give them a certificate of registration that their bylaw has been registered. Then it becomes the bylaw of the corporation. The secretary, what's well, sorry, the board 
will then issue to each unit owner. That document that has the certification of the registry. Yeah. To each owner. Okay. Okay. So I guess full circle back to where this originally started <laughs> no. from is at what point is the board obligated to uh, or the condo uh, management company obligated to give the bylaws or draft form uh, to a prospective buyer? Well, it is so assuming we uh, as I'm amending this well, um, I have three amendments now to yep. uh, a fourth one is coming to but as I feel I'm, after this conversation there's going to be a lot more than four <laughs> well, Chuck, you might have to have someone be oh uh, God, it's, filtering it's a, your calls a lot of work. It's yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> now, let me say this right? okay. okay until a bylaw is amended, repealed or changed what was still is Okay. So when a new home buyer is coming to buy, he will be presented with the old bylaw. Well, the existing bylaw. Yes. But you people are obligated, the board is obligated to say to the home buyer, oh, you know, um, we are in the process of amending this. We are not sure yet of the length and breadth of the amendment. Okay. But when we finally get that amendment, it will also be given to you. Okay? Okay. Um, the, the home buyer might say, um, all right, but will my obligations be different in the new one as against the old one? All right? It is also your responsibility to say to them that we anticipate that the amendments will be in line with the condominium property law. Okay, with with the act, right? So yeah, well, okay. Even if you don't, yeah. even if you can't remember the act, yeah, fair enough. Just say the condominium yeah. property law. law. Okay. And we advise you, um, perhaps, to seek legal advice. Okay. Yeah. Okay, on on this just the, to finish up this this thread in this vein yeah. for uh, documents of, of lesser uh, significance. So we're not on bylaws now, but say we're doing a reserve so, fund sorry, study. While we are on this um, vein of meetings, yeah. right? Good. Um, I want owners of condominium units to know that. So it's not only the board that can convene a meeting. Uh, perfect, yes. Talk about this and Con then we'll move condominium on. Condominium yeah. unit owners can request in writing. Okay. So you request in writing for the convening of, it's called a special meeting. Yeah. For the convening of a special meeting. But those convening must not be less than 15% okay, of so, the unit owner. Pardon me, I've, I've had too much it's coffee okay. now. Um, so, so let me just, let me just finish. finish. Okay. Yes. It must not be less than 15% okay. of the unit owners. Okay? That is one. Two, you must let them know why you, are, why you want them to convene that meeting. So the reason for your request must be written in the notice to them, to the board, right? Three, they must, within 30 days of receiving that notice, convene that meeting. It's not may. They will, within 30 days of convening that meeting, of, of, um, of receiving that notice, convene, convene that meeting. meeting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just needed to point that no, out. No, no, no. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Chuck, uh, you, you've opened up a can of worms or, or another rabbit hole that we're going to go down. <laughs> okay. So theory and practice on this one, okay. right? Um, one, what happens if a board doesn't comply? Okay. What then is the escalation point or, or how then does this 15% uh, move forward? Okay, so 
you know, um, there are there is a power contained in a vote. Okay. All right. Um, most times, and, and we've seen this before, a situation where there is an annual general meeting. Okay. Yep. And the board has done so many wrongs that the unit owner has now voted to change the board. Okay. And so then that, that vote is then, the vote then carries the day, right? Okay. Another thing is this. If they do not comply, and um, unfortunately, Drew, um, in as much as I like going to court, because of the cost for clients, I, but, but if that, you know, that 15% can share the cost of litigation. Right? Okay, so that's the escalation, right. that that's they would have right. to. Right, they have go to, you know, go to either the Court of Justice, yep. Alberta Court of Justice, or the Court of Queen's Bench. The King's Bench. I, I would prefer the Court of King's Bench because um, then, um, you know, the, 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 the issues if, if they are stronger than that, can then be, you know, our better court of justice, um, if you were asking for damage, their level of um, jurisdiction is 100,000, right? Right. Yes, so, but, you know, court of King's Bench. Sky's the limit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> within reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah within reason. So they can go to court and ask for, um, uh, a declaration that there is compliance with that part. A declaration that having complied, that these people are duty bound to do this under and by virtue of section B of the law. An order okay. against them to do that. Okay. Second thing yeah. um, are tactics that the board can take to uh, prevent this from happening. So uh, a good one that I've seen is uh, is uh, a, a number of unit owners mm -hmm. will sign a document, mm -hmm. okay? The board will then come back and say, sorry, but there's nothing that says that these people are actual unit owners start again, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, like um, that's, that's difficult to comprehend, Drew, okay. because right, um, a tenant is not a, a unit owner. Correct. The tenant is not a unit owner. A tenant is not a unit owner. A unit yep. owner is a unit owner. That's right. Right? Yep. And so if a board comes back and says, um, we've looked at our records, Chuck is not a unit owner. Wow. That is, you are denying every vestige of contract. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. I may have not articulated myself properly here. Okay. The, the um, say the board, uh, so a tactic is, uh, trying to uh, ensure that those that are are uh, trying to call for this 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 meeting mm -hmm. go through a very specific channel, and I don't think everybody real anybody really knows what that channel is. Drew, there I, is no there is no channel. There is no barefoot straight. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, so, so okay, but let, let me finish no, this no, time. No, 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 let me finish. No, 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 they all uh, sign those, and it's attached to a uh, a form that says, you know, we want to hold a meeting such and such a date for this reason. Now right? you've said last year's proxies, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, okay. well, well, uh, no, I'm just underlining certain phrases you're using. Yes. Last year's proxies. Yeah, yeah, like they've used okay. a, a form that's already been produced by the the board, right? Okay. They sent for, for which the meeting has held. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. The um the I'm not shooting down certain things that you're that's right. Yeah, no, perfect, perfect. And and it's good that we're doing this. Good that we're doing this, right? Oh, yeah. 
uh, the board engages their lawyer yeah. and the lawyer says uh, this is not a, a valid submission because we can't validate these signatures. Please start again. Or unfortunately, we're not going to hold a, a town hall. We're not going to hold this, this meeting. Does that even make sense? Drew, um, if such a situation came to you, yes. I would simply point them to the law. Mm -hmm. First of all, proxy is for a definite reason. Okay. For to use in a definite circumstance. Okay. For a specific purpose and for a particular time. Okay. Proxy. So we've sent out a proxy. We've held the meeting. Decisions have been made. All right. Mm -hmm. If you guys want anything else, right? And this is why I, I mentioned that fifteen percent. You know, people, right? The fifteen percent will not include what was signed earlier. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That is number one. Number two. Although the law provides that a proxy will expire like six months after it was made, mm -hmm. after, after the date for which it was published was made, six months after it will expire. Or if an expiry date, for example, when I prepare proxy forms yeah. for my clients, my condominium corporation clients, when I prepare pro proxy forms, one of the things I write there specifically is that this form is for this purpose to be used in this meeting will expire immediately after the meeting. That way, nobody is coming and bringing uh, September proxy yeah. to use to influence a decision of the future. Okay. Okay. So, so, and that is why I was underlining certain things you were. You know, <laughs> saying, <Okay. right? laughs> yeah. So, so it's proper. Let me just say it. it yeah. The lawyer, it, it's proper for them to say, and and this is why, you know. And I'm not lifting up lawyers here. I'm, I'm not advertising lawyers. Yeah. Right? So yeah. when they say seek legal advice, yeah, this is one of the reasons why you should seek legal advice. So if, uh, if we alter our our question to go mm -hmm. to say, how. Could this fifteen percent? Uh, right. Um, uh, what would be the best way for them to go about properly trying to convene this meeting? It, the law, yeah, is clear on that. Okay. Write to the board. In that letter to the board, tell them we want you to convene a special meeting. Okay. This is the reason why we are asking for you to convene a special meeting. The law again says that when the board receives that notice, 30 days, mm -hmm. 30 days after that notice, they must, it's not maybe, they must convene the meeting. However, yeah. you've now raised an issue. Okay. The issue you've raised is this. Remember when I was trying to describe the concept of a meeting properly convened? Yes. I'm also going to say to you now, this 15% is, are the signatures proper? Are they, you know, are, 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 do we have within them proxy from last year? Okay. Right? So, so before we get to the stage of that the board must, the board itself has to see whether there is, whether what they've done is proper. Okay. And what is proper? What is proper is this, that existing now, 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 15%, Drew goes to Unit to unit, get signatures, and they all agree, fifteen percent. 
you attach it, you, you write the names of the people, their unit numbers, the names of the people, their unit numbers, you write, you know, um, you know, identification. So they know, because the secretary will go to the, the whatever and say, oh, okay, Drew is there, this is there, 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 15%. You write to the board, convene this meeting. This is why we are asking you to convene the meeting, including removing a member of the board. Okay. If you don't like a member of the board, if you people don't like a member of the board, so let all owners know that they have the power also to remove the member of a member of the board in a properly convened special meeting. Okay, okay, and so you've got you've met these requirements. Uh, unit number, um, right, right, and it's got a signature on the end. Mm -hmm. Is what is the responsibility of the the board to go ah? This is a legitimate signature, or is there is there is there uh, something that this this group needs to do to ensure that the signature that has been signed is is authentic? So you know, um, and and so when I was discussing earlier, I talked about the act, the regulation, mm -hmm. the, the bylaws and rules. Yeah. So the board might have its rules, right? To say. Okay, when we receive something like this, this let's check first of all. Okay. Yeah. Because Drew, they must also do their due diligence. Yeah, they can't blindly just say yeah. no. This looks. Yeah. Yeah. You know they must do their due diligence. Okay. Right. They, because the the people who have given the notice have provided a list, right? And the list says, "Oh, Drew, number one. Okay, we have his phone number. Um, hi, Drew." Um, we, we are seeing a resolution for us to call a special meeting and um, we see your signature. Can you confirm? That you signed it. Okay. You sign it? Oh, yes, I did. All right. You call number two. You call number three. Yeah. All right. Because if you go and convene a special meeting and Drew hears about it and he's asking you guys, well, how come you convened a special meeting? I didn't sign it. Yeah. You know? I said, but you, you, you were part of you signed. He said, no, I don't know anything about it, right? Yeah. So, so that is impersonation. Okay. So that, that gets you into another realm. Yeah. All right? So you've impersonated Drew. You've taken action, you know, for Drew. You have not consulted him without his knowledge, without his permission, without his consent. Yeah. Wow. So you should, as the board, do your own due diligence. When... Um, so when I when I had um, when I drafted some rules for for a board, one of the boards I represent, when I drafted some rules, right? Um, those rules also one of the things that I put there is this concept of that every board member must act in good faith. Right. In good faith, you know. Um, there is no perfect situation, but as long as you can show that your actions were in good faith. So when this board you're talking about now went to their lawyer for mm -hmm. advice, that was acting in good faith, right? To, gotcha. to okay. be sure that they were prim and proper. That right. They had their dogs in the room. Okay. Right. Okay. You know what? We have taken up a ton of time. I know that there's a break uh, again pending and that there's some additional questions uh, that need to be asked um, by different people. I'm going to stop here. Okay. Thank you so much, You're Chuck, for, for absolutely everything. <laughs> You're and welcome. I, and again, it's, it's, um, I feel another one of these happening in, in the not too distant future. You know, Drew, I am at, um, let me say, let me put it this way. I'm at your disposal. Okay. Because nothing excites us more in, uh, in Osuji and Smith lawyers. Right? Yeah. Nothing excites us more than letting the individual, the person, know that they have a right and that this right is protected by the law, and that they have a right to ask that that law that protects that right should be enforced. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Okay, we'll pause here. All right.
um, so an employee is um, somebody who is employed by a, a company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, that could be employed by an individual also, okay, um, on a salary, either for a fixed term or an indefinite term, right? And um, when that is the case, the provisions of the Alberta government could affect that person. Um, well, except if the person is unionized, it belongs to a union, right? Mm -hmm. So that then other um, legislation then affects that person, okay? Because the person is in a, is part of a union, right? So, and then um, there are there are negotiations that can go on um, as as per the contract of employment. Okay. Okay. Yep. And um, we've also come across situations where individuals don't have contracts of employment, right? There is just by word of mouth or a handshake. Yeah, a handshake, <laughs> right? But even at that, the law still protects them. Okay, the law still provides that, well, in the absence of this a, a formal contract, these are some of the basic standard requirements of an employment contract, right? Okay, yeah. Now, um, so that employee, everything that the employee requires to do the work for the employer will be provided by the employer. Mm -hmm. okay. Laid out in an employment contract. Well, so what is required to do, so if I, if I employ you as a video specialist, you know, the employment contract will not provide that I will give you a video camera. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, mm -hmm. yes. But, you know, in order for me to fulfill the terms of the employment contract, I will need a video camera that will be provided by the employer. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is different from a contractor. A contractor is not employed. What the is not employed by the employee. The contractor is contracted by the employee to do a certain job. Fulfill services. Yes. Yeah. Okay. To fulfill services, right? And um, under the law, sometimes this has posed a problem. So the contractor comes with his facilities, mm -hmm. comes with his you know, the facilities he requires to fulfill the terms of the contract between himself that was contracted and the individual or company contracting him, okay? The gray area has been, um, there have been situations where you, you call somebody a contractor, but so when you, when you involve a contractor, when you when you employ an individual as an employee, mm -hmm. you set the hours, mm -hmm. you set the terms, you you set holidays when you take vacation and all of that. For a contractor, mm -hmm. his time is his own. Mm -hmm. the, um, holiday time is not involved. Vacation pay is not involved. It is this. Move this for me from here to here. I will pay you this. That's all. So is there guidelines that establish essentially what is an employee and what is a contractor? Well, you see, so the, the contractor is not protected by the employment code. Yes. Okay. It's not. Protected. Yep. The, the, the contractor is protected by the terms of the contract okay. that is signed mm -hmm. between him and the person who contracted him. But what I was trying to explain is this, that one of the important incidences of the contractual, contractual relationship is that the contractor provides his own paraphernalia mm -hmm. for fulfilling the terms of the contract, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the gray area appears where the, con the, the paraphernalia provided by, to the contractor comes from the person. Okay. Right? Yep. Who has asked you to come and do the job, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Sometimes people have come up and said, that makes me an employee. Then the employer says, no, I employed you on a contract basis. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Right? So what the courts have done is to look at the incidences of control. Mm -hmm. Where does this person do this job? Mm -hmm. What facilities does he use? Okay, if he says, who has set the time for him to work? Because there are incidences of an employment contract. So if those incidences now dovetail and affect the contractor, right? The courts have held in certain circumstances that that is an employment contract mm -hmm. and not a contractor mm -hmm. contract, mm -hmm. okay? So when you call somebody a contractor, you must be careful yes. to make sure that, you know, um, you are strictly keeping to what makes that person a contractor. All right. Mm -hmm. You don't set my time. You don't. You don't. You know. Tell me. Okay. You can go on break from this time to this time. You don't provide me the paraphernalia to do the work, and then you know you you, you now delimit where I can work, and then you say I'm not an employee. Mm -hmm. All right. So that removes me from a contractor into the realm of being an employee, mm -hmm. and so protected under the um, um, Alberta Employment Code. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, have you worked on cases before where the somebody was laid out as an independent contractor, but they were actually fulfilling the terms of, of an employee? Of, of an employee. Of course, yes, of course. You know, and um, you know, and and in that situation, right? In that situation, what then? Um, what then happened is that you know, um, the, the this individual was even given. <laughs> vacation time right <laughs> yes he was given vacation time he was told so that would be establishing an employee yes, relationship right yes. you were he was told when to go on break mm -hmm. when to continue to work when to stop mm -hmm. right because he gave evidence to show that look because of the nature of the work i could have walked up into the night right mm -hmm. in order to finish this job on time and move on to other contracts mm -hmm. But this man said, no, you can only work from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Meeting the criteria for Meeting an employee. The, right, yes. right. So, yep. And then, you know, um, it, and some of those other incidences of employment. So our argument then became that this was an employee. Mm -hmm. This was an employee, mm -hmm. right? Because um, what he wanted to do was to work from his, he had this, um, this, big tow truck thing where he had, you know, he could walk from in there. Yeah. But the employer said, no, we need to know that you're doing this job, so you must be here. You must come in into this place, right? Mm -hmm. So all of those things, right? Um, um, putting boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So our argument was then that um, that converted it from a contractual relationship mm -hmm. to um, um, an employee relationship. So what advice do you have for somebody that's been hired as an independent contractor, but their employer or the person that they're, you know, contracted by yeah. is trying to dictate uh, employee um, kind of uh, well, laying out as a, an employee when they're an independent You let them contractor. know. Yeah. You let them know. You say, look, and, and you know, this is one thing I must let people know. Um, when it comes to negotiating a contract, mm -hmm. you need to be careful, right? If you don't understand something, ask about it. Mm -hmm. Talk about it. Mm -hmm. And there is no law that prevents you from seeking legal advice before you sign anything. Mm -hmm. No law prevents you from seeking. A lot of times here, right? Um, when clients come to us and say, oh, they've given me three days to respond or to do this, we always say to them, look, tell them, write back and say, please extend this time because I'm, I intend to seek legal advice. Yeah, yeah. You know, Claire, if we bring that to the court and the court sees that you people refused, mm -hmm. right? There is what is called adverse inference. Okay. Adverse. So the court would say, 
oh, okay, you didn't want this guy to seek legal advice, right? Mm -hmm. There must be something you're hiding. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh -huh. There must be. So my advice to everybody, not even contractors, not anybody, right? Read something. <laughs> Someone said that the reason why banks and all these institutions put things in small, small print <laughs> is by the time you look at them, you say, hmm, then you sign, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's how it is. But read it. Of course. If you don't understand it, ask questions. Absolutely. So when somebody employs you and is telling you you will work from here to here, you will do this, this, you will, you know, the, the only problem is that because you want to compete for that contract, there are then other factors that make you bend, right? Yeah. Say so yes, but, but ordinarily, in the normal sense of things, in the normal run of play, right? You should say, this is how I work. This is how I'm going to execute this contract. This is how I'm going to proceed. This is how I'm going to continue. This is how I'm going to end. For heaven's sake, open your mouth mm -hmm. and talk mm -hmm. and ask. Speak up for yourself. Yeah. yeah. yeah Protect yourself. Um, do you have any advice for somebody that is recently terminated? Um, and their employer is trying to suggest that they need to sign a release uh, in that moment? Well, you know, um, that is not right. Do not sign. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what the release is. Do not sign. Come and see Chuck. Come and see Chuck. Chuck will let you know, mm -hmm. right? Now, releases are standard. Yeah. They are standard things. All they say is, okay, you won't um, take us to court. Everything about this mm -hmm. employment has ended and stuff. But I need you to know that before you sign a release, it must a release is a consideration. Mm -hmm. It's an additional thing they are giving to you, right? A release does not affect what they should give you mm -hmm. ordinarily. Mm -hmm. Undone by virtue mm -hmm. of the fact that they've terminated your employment mm -hmm. and what is due to you under the employment code. And if we see that you are entitled to common law damages, what you are entitled to under common law damages, mm -hmm. that is different. Mm -hmm. if, you, if they want you to sign a release, then it is an additional thing. It is an additional incentive they are giving to you to say, look, all right, look, let all of this matter end. It relinquishes liability after the right, fact. Yeah. Right, Let all of this matter end. Don't take us to court. Don't do this. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. And to ensure that this is agreeable with you, mm -hmm. we are giving you this additional amount of mm -hmm. money. So okay. can you specify that the employer at the time of termination cannot force the employee to sign in that moment? They no, have a cannot. right to review no, 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 and cannot. seek independent legal counsel see, and advice, right? See, yeah. um, in, in the world of practice, mm -hmm. in the world of legal practice, the, the courts have also taken judicial notice mm -hmm. of the fact that when you say, I want to seek legal advice, you should be allowed to seek legal advice. Mm -hmm. You should be allowed to seek legal advice. Now, while we're on that topic, if an employer gives uh, the uh, release letter and, mm -hmm. and states, you know, you have 24 hours to sign this and get it back to us, is that a sufficient amount of time or is somebody within their right to seek uh, uh, an extension to properly review those documents? I, I think that that is very unfair. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I will talk of adverse influence, mm -hmm. right? Adverse inference is a situation where, you know, someone should be given the opportunity to do something. So In a when you give me yeah. a short time, yeah. what, is the, what is different between not giving me time at all? Yeah. Right? There is no difference, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So well, most employment contracts I've seen, most releases will say, okay, get back to us by like three days four days and mm -hmm. stuff, right? Yeah. But, and I'm saying this now, please, if you're in that situation, tell them I need more time. Write it. Don't give, don't phone. Put it in writing, yes, email, don't, requesting Don't call the HR. Yeah. You know, put it in writing. I, Chuck always prefers a paper trail. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love paper trails so much. Please, 
And when you are when you are putting that thing in writing, you let them know this time is not sufficient for me to, to, properly reveal. to, to go and book the services of a lawyer mm -hmm. for the purposes of getting independent legal advice. I am asking for this time. Mm -hmm. I want you to extend it to this time. Mm -hmm. All right? Extend it for me to enable me go and seek proper independent legal advice. Put it in writing, please. Don't come to Chuck and say, Chuck, you know when they said this, I get them a call and, and I'm like, where is the record? Always in then, writing. Uh, then you're asking me to go and apply for phone records from tellers and, you know. Mm -hmm. Please Absolutely. always put it in writing, right? Put things in writing. Okay, Chuck, next question. How do non-compete agreements work and what factors determine their enforceability? Okay. Um, People, um, non-compete is very serious, mm -hmm. all right? Non-compete is very serious. And I want you to take it seriously, people. Take it seriously, right? Because the, your former employer can come after you, mm -hmm. right? For it is enforceable. Than it. Yes, it's, yeah. it's enforceable, right? Um, so non-compete clauses just have to do with the ability of an employer to protect their interest, their business interest, right? They are, a, a client once came and said, um, Chuck, you know, um, on the weekends, I do something else. And um, I asked him, I said, that thing you do, does it relate to the business of your employer? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, but I do it on the weekend. I said, well, you know, um, it's like Chuck, who is a lawyer saying, okay, um, I'm a lawyer Monday to Friday. On weekends, I'm not a lawyer. And, and I said to him that the, there are some incidences of um, employment that follow you everywhere. So I said to him, I said, the, the intelligence, the knowledge, the, the technical know-how that you use on the weekends, where did you get it from? Is it not from working on that job? Uh, yes. He said, well, yes. I said, good. Mm -hmm. So you, you cannot be competing mm -hmm. with your employer. And some people wouldn't take that in, into right. consideration. No, yeah. but, but, yeah. but let them know that now. right? So I'm glad that this program is happening. Mm -hmm. right? Do not go working on the weekends for another or on another job that relates directly to what your employer is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you are done with employment also. I, I, in, in, in most employment contracts we've drafted or and we've seen. Reviewed, yeah. We, we've reviewed, right? Um, we, we always see this non-compete section mm -hmm. and it is important. This is why, and I, I, I go back to independent legal advice. Please, before you sign any employment contract, mm -hmm. you know, don't say, oh, Chuck, they were on me, they were... Tell them I want to seek independent legal advice. Mm -hmm. Before signing because thing, yeah. when you come to Chuck, he will explain that non-compete thing to you. Mm -hmm. Claire, the, the problem has arisen in some circumstances where some non-compete clauses have been found to be verbose, you know, um, unnecessarily delimiting, right? Yeah. Um, in restraint of trade in restraint of business. So when you're telling somebody you, you can't take any job within 200 kilometers for two years, mm -hmm. wow. Are you, are you saying the person should move out of Alberta? Mm -hmm. Are there, is there legislation that um, covers that as far as the boundaries that somebody's able to enforce it's, in a non-complete? It, non no, it's, it's, um, it's, so there have been decisions of the court, Okay. right? Um, the, saying, oh, this is too much, or this is too broad. This would be considered unreasonable. Right, unreasonable, yeah. right? Okay. This is too much, this is too broad. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean? Okay, and let me give you an example. Recently, a client came, and um, he had worked in an, um, he had worked in one of the cities up, um, up north, right? And so he had left the company, and they said, you can't walk within 200 kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. So 
That means if we began to circumscribe 200 kilometers, mm -hmm. he would have to move his home. That's pretty broad. Move his yeah. family. Change. Wow, mm -hmm. right? And, and I'm like, well, you know, um, and then for two years. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm like, no, you don't worry. We, we, you, it can be two years, right? Mm -hmm. Six months is not reasonable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Six months is not unreasonable. 50 kilometers is also not unreasonable, right? Mm -hmm. For 200 kilometers, you're asking me to... For two to, years is a yeah, long time. To, to get out, yeah. And, yeah. You know, move out of town and stuff. And, you, you know, you can't do that. Are you are you going to give me money to, to get a new home? Mm -hmm. to be, right? And I have a family to feed. Of course. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, so employers, I'm also saying to you, let your non-compete times, distances, circumferences be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay, consider consider the reasonableness of these things, right? And uh, you know, the, the world is now, like they say, global village, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it needs to be reasonable. All right? Of course, yeah. yeah. Are you guys okay over there? Did my thing crap out or what? Yeah, I think the battery died on it. So uh, it's, uh, charging it right Chuck just goes into so much detail. <laughs> just Sorry. kidding. Okay. Um, what are the most common issues that clients seek assistance within family law cases? Family. Oh, you want to pause? Yeah. Just yeah. Second. Okay, I'll repeat that Even one. You had like 50. I think. Yeah. Did I make it work, Drew? Let's do this thing. Okay, thank you. Claire? Yes. Just wait a little bit your phone line. My new one, too? Yes. What the heck? No button. Okay, Chuck. What are the most common issues that clients seek assistance with in family law cases? Oh. Break it down for us. Yeah, you know, um, family law. What's it's, the most um, common it, thing you I see? Know, I yeah. know. It's, it, incidentally, it's, um, it's part of our day-to-day, -day, well, minute-to-minute existence, right? Mm -hmm. um, Family law, what do they seek assistance with most? Well, child support, um, parenting, mm -hmm. section seven, and section sevens are skating, um, you know, extracurricular activities, right? Mm -hmm. um, the one that's not so volatile is how to share property, right? Mm -hmm. Because the law is clear on those aspects. You're talking about the breakdown of matrimonial yes, property, essentially, yeah. Yes. So the law, there are some laws guiding, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, who will have primary parenting, who will be sole parent, who will have decision-making authority, right? And um, it's, it's not always very, um, it's not always very difficult in a situation where, um, the man or the woman has shown that um, they, they, they do not need to have access to the kids without supervision, mm -hmm. right? Maybe there has been family violence and stuff like that, mm -hmm. okay? But when parties come, they, you, you find out that most of the time they've come to say, okay, um, you know, um, how much is he gonna pay for child support? Oh, Chuck, he's hiding money. He's taking money under the table. Mm -hmm. he's, so we begin to go into, you know, asking for financial documents mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that, just to see mm -hmm. how um, how much money the guidelines will ask him to pay mm -hmm. for child support. And that's supported by a notice to disclose, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we file the notice to disclose and serve it on the other party. But while you're filing your notice to disclose, you as well of course. should disclose your own, yep. right? Right. So, which is a common um, ask from yes, the other parties, right? right? Yep. Right. So, well, you don't even they don't need to ask for it. It's now part of the law mm -hmm. that you know, in in line with asking for another person's documents, mm -hmm. you also should provide yours. Yep. Right. Good. So fair is fair. Yeah. So good. Fair is fair. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, then you you when you settle child support. Of course, child support will be based on who is the primary parent, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is section three child support and there is section nine. Section nine has to do with where the 
other party has the, the children like 40% of the time, you know, it's near 50, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. So um, there will be an offset kind of, right? Um, so what, what, how much does the man make? How much will he pay for child support? How much does the woman make? How much should she pay for child support? Mm -hmm. So when we find out both figures, we now do an offset, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes too, Claire, um, property issues have been very problematic, right? Um, you find a situation where there is a corporation involved. Um, and so you're looking at how much assessing the corporation, how much assets does the corporation have, how much, um, how much money has this, the, the, the primary operator of the corporation been taking from it, right? Mm -hmm. And then how much money is the corporation making, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that becomes a problem because sometimes people have used corporation to hide money. Mm -hmm. So we then go into the concept of questioning, right? Finding out, okay, you, you say, so we ask for the, um, the, the, um, um, the year end financials of the corporation, mm -hmm. which will contain um, an item by item Oh, we used we spent this on telephone. We spent this on fuel. An itemized receipt right. almost of the yes. expenses. So, yeah. So we then go into questioning to find out, for example, okay, you you've put fifteen thousand dollars against telephone, right? Now this phone, um, how what percentage of time do you use it mm -hmm. for the business? Mm -hmm. Okay, I use it sixty percent of the time. Okay, so forty percent you use it on yourself, right? Okay, we will now find out what 40% of that 15,000 is. Yeah. And it will be added to your income. Okay. Good, yeah. to added to your income. So property issues are there. Who occupies the home? Are we going to sell the home, right? Um, you know, um, and one thing I must point out here is that people come to me and say, they say, Chuck, the kids are living in the house. I don't want it sold. You know, when the court is considering what's in the best interest of the child, one of the things that is not on the top of the list is whether the child should be left to live in the home. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you understand? Yeah. So that's not on the top of the list, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, so you cannot say, I don't want the house not to be sold because that's where my kids live. Mm -hmm. No. So that can't be a default. That has to be something that's negotiated between good, parents. Good. Yes. So it's not like, you know, there are, there are things the court have said will constitute what is in the best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, things like the child's safety, health, mm -hmm. um, you know, with whom the child relates with, religion, mm -hmm. uh, friends they associate with, mm -hmm. culture, and all of those things. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, so sometimes too, they, they've brought problems about um, and this is a usual one, family violence, right? Yeah. There have been, so most times um, you find that some, some people come and say, oh, he did this to me, he did that to me, and all of that. Of course, the police become involved, they throw the man out of the house, mm -hmm. and all of that, okay? And then um, the parties, and now they now give no contact, nothing, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh, and stuff. So um, family violence, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, well, it's good that there is family viol uh, legislation against family violence. Yeah. But again, it has been used and abused. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It has yeah. been used and abused. So um, unfortunately, that's some of the um, some of the incidences of our society, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not right to to abuse someone violently, mm -hmm. but you know, it's always very easy to call the police, and every time the police is called, and um, I, I, there is this case I'm handling now, the lady called the police and then started screaming. Like she was screaming, oh, he, he's a, he has a knife, he has a knife, and all of that, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. 
So, um, of course, whether he had a knife or not, he, my client told me that he didn't have it. He wasn't even, mm -hmm. you know, that when the altercation started, mm -hmm. he, he left the house, mm -hmm. right? And stayed outside, right? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, when the police came, oh, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And all that. So, that's, that's the, it, it's been abused. Of right? course, but, in order to get yes, evidence against, and, and yeah, that. which is unfortunate. Yes, so yeah. those are some of the issues. Um, but ma majority of them bother on, you know, parenting and the incidences of parenting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I've had, I've had um, clients fight over a cat. You know, a cat? Yeah, a cat, yeah. a dog, right? Yeah. Um, those are my babies. I, I want them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, stuff like that, right? So, of course. And then we've, we've said, okay, why don't we, a cat stays two, two weeks, or stays two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, because this is family law, there are things that are personal. Of course, yeah. People, right? yeah. There are things that are personal mm -hmm. um, to people. Okay, on that topic, how is child support calculated? Well, um, so th there are some incidences of uh, child support we must appreciate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, there is um, legislation, it's called um, the Child Support um, Guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so those child support guidelines provide for how child support is calculated. Um, basically, in a situation where let me use the wife. The wife has the children maybe 80% of the time, right? Child support will be calculated based on the income of the man, right? Mm -hmm. So some men come to me and say, um, you know, um, she wants me to pay this amount of child support, but she hasn't given me her financial documents. And I'm like, well, for child support, the woman's financial documents are not relevant under certain situations. If the woman has the children majority of the time, mm -hmm. then her income is not relevant. But for calculating how much we should pay, if, if we are paying for hockey, which is an the extra, extra curricular, curricular, yeah. then her income is necessary. Because then we are calculating proportionality, mm -hmm. all right? Good. We are calculating, but for child support, it is based on your income and it is based on the province. So if, for example, the man is living in British Columbia, mm -hmm. but the family is here in Alberta, we can't use Alberta calculations. We have to use British Columbia yeah. calculations. So you have to follow the jurisdiction. Yes, yeah. the jurisdiction. That is one. Two, um, if it's always easier, Claire, when the man is employed, right? Yes. So he makes X number of dollars. That is clear. Which can be clearly identified. Yes, we yeah. can then find out, right? Yeah. If the man is employed, he makes X number of dollars. It becomes more difficult when the man is self-employed. Mm -hmm. If he runs a corporation, those then you begin to get into the nitty-gritty of exchanging documentation. And Claire, when it comes to disclosure documents affecting corporations, oh, the law is so technical in that area. Mm -hmm. That is why you need a lawyer. You don't want to navigate that you on your own. You don't want to. I'm telling you, as a self-represented litigant, you don't want to navigate that area without the assistance, without Chuck's assistance. Let me not say get a lawyer. Get Chuck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, without Chuck's assistance, right? So, so because you know there are so many minute things that mm -hmm. require that the person who has this corporation needs to, you know, provide mm -hmm. for us to be able to calculate and say, okay, this is probably how much this person is making. Mm -hmm. Now, Claire, in a situation where the man has the kids 50% of the time. The woman has the kids 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. In that kind of situation, it means there is joint decision making. Yep. Right. So there is what is called an offset. What is an offset? So we first of all find out how much does the man make. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So in that situation, the woman's own income statements yep. become important. Yes. So we find out how much does the man make. He makes ten dollars. Okay. How much should he be paying for child support? Right. Mm -hmm. We find that out. How much does the woman make? She makes five. How much should she be paying for child support? Mm -hmm. We find that out. The difference between what the man should pay and the what and what the woman should pay becomes an offset. It's to subsidize, essentially, right? No, no, no. no. Okay. So, first of all, it's 50-50, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's say the man, every time the, the children are with the woman, the man pays $5 in child support. Okay. Then every time the children are with the man, the woman pays $3 in child support. Mm -hmm. What the man would then be giving to the woman is $2. Okay. That is the offset amount. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So, so look at it this way. If every month the man takes $5 and gives to the woman, and then every month the woman takes $3 and gives to the man, it's so it's 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 um, the offset amount is two dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Good. But when you're doing a child support order for people who are 50-50, mm -hmm. it you must state first of all that the man should pay this, mm -hmm. then state the woman should pay this, then state this is the offset amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh -huh. because sometimes men would not accept that child support order for registration mm -hmm. if those things are not outlined. And that's all outlined in the child support order. If it's okay. outlined in the child support order. Then there is a situation where, you know, um, um, the, the man has the children 40% of the time. Then the woman has the children 60% of the time. So those calculations are done under section 9 of the child support guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. So there is also an offset amount issue there, all right? Yeah. Good. Now, sometimes also um, in negotiating child support, there are some other things that are taken into consideration, right? So if the man lives in British Columbia and he's coming to see his kids in Alberta and he stays in the hotel and he, you know, he spends time, fuel, he mm -hmm. comes, right? That's to exercise access. Yeah, and just the visitation. He, yes, yeah. he spends this amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. You can apply to the court, right? For the court to um, deviate mm -hmm. from the child support guideline. As a form of kind of deduction? Yes. Okay. Right, and say, um, Justice, um, um, Madam Justice, um, sorry, we don't call Madam uh, Sir now because the the, 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 the law is now trying to... We'll cut know, that out. Right, <laughs> all those things. So, say justice A or B, um, this is how much it costs my client to have access. Yeah. Right? So, but this is how much we're paying in child support. Okay. You know, can we ask for an adjustment mm -hmm. based on that? Okay. Okay, next question, Chuck. Okay, civil. How does the statute of limitations impact civil cases and why is it important for individuals to be aware of this? Oh, you know, um, I, and I, I, I say this generally to everybody. Um, well, recently I had a, a consult with a client and one of the things I pointed out to the client is I said, hey, um, in the next three months, you are going to be out. Now, there is a legislation called the Statute of Limitations, right? So it provides for things must end, mm -hmm. issues must end, mm -hmm. right? So it provides that, um, you know, if you don't, if you have a complaint about something, if you don't approach the courts within two years of the time you became aware or ought to have become aware, Right mm -hmm. now, there are other circumstances of ten years, but ten years has been the the, the greatest time, right? Mm -hmm. So, if for example, um, you went to Brazil and something happened in Canada, or I took your land, or 
took your money or something, right? Mm -hmm. And you came in 11 years after, mm -hmm. right? The 10 years would be considered because, so the issue would now be where you are aware or should you have been aware? Was there any way something like this ought to have been brought to your attention? And you failed to. You failed, yes. Right? Okay. So, so um, I have a I have a client living in Australia. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the funny thing is that um, the time we we have calls, right, mm -hmm. is very <laughs> yeah yes, a little backwards. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little backwards. So, but you know, um, when he told me, he said, "Chop." look at this, look at this, look at this. And I'm like, you know, um, so he sent me the contract. Mm -hmm. And luckily, the contract said that, um, you know, that the man should make a request, a formal request for the repayment mm -hmm. of that money, right? So I said, okay, maybe we'll get away with that argument. So what you should now do is make a formal request and let your time begin to run mm -hmm. from the date you make that request. Mm -hmm. All right? Because ordinarily, based on the contract, it's been beyond two years, right? Yeah. Uh, but if the contract said make a request, then make that request yeah, for payment and mm -hmm. stuff so that your time. Limitation deadlines are very important because you know if the if the law says do this within this time and you don't. It is, it, there is no, please, um, can you please? No, it mm -hmm. is strict. Yes. The, the courts are very strict on limitation deadlines. And it has to be, right? Yes, it has to be. Yeah. Like I said, things have to end. Mm -hmm. Things have to end. So um, when your lawyer has a limitation argument, they should also raise it when they are filing your statement of defense or a defense, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. They should raise it in that document and say, well, this thing has happened beyond two years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this claim is affected by the limitation, um, by the um, limitation act, okay? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, you know, don't sit down and think you have forever. Mm -hmm. You don't have forever, right? Mm -hmm. Always recognize the date and time. The clock's happening. ticking. Yes. Yeah. You know, and then you make sure you you take action within, you know, the, the within the two years. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's let me not even use the 10 years example. Mm -hmm. Let me let me say, make sure you take action within two years. Two years. People, two years, limitation deadline. Okay. If you're off by one day, you are out. Mm -hmm. If you're off by one day, you are out. Limitation deadlines are very, very important. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for sharing. Okay, Chuck. Okay, two more. Um, Chuck, can you tell us what is a will and why is it important for individuals to have one? My dear, um, people have come to me and said, oh, Chuck, I'm young. I don't need a will. That's not true. There is no age limit or age. Will, making of wills is not about grandpa and grandma, mm -hmm. right? Making of wills is about you stating in a document, this is, in, in the event that I die today, this is how I want this done, that done, as it affects properties that I have control over. Mm -hmm. Now, what is a will? It's simply a document in which you give instructions about what should happen to incidences of property belonging to you legally, mm -hmm. right? What should happen to them after you're no more or after you die? That's all. Now, there are different types of will. There is the holographic will, you know, wills written with hand, right? Mm -hmm. There is the formal will where you come to Chuck and Chuck sits you down, gets your details and prepares a will for you. Mm -hmm. And in formal wills, when, when you're talking of informal will, there are signature requirements yeah. by the law. 
There is, so under the Wills and Successions Act, there, is, there are ways and channels and processes of how to make a will, execute a will. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yep. And who should be your executor, who should not be, all those things are there. Right? Good. Um, there is, there is a, a, will, a will issue I'm handling right now. Um, the, the man said he was in yellow knife, but the lawyer prepared it. He's in Alberta, and uh, you know it, it, it's so confusing, right? So we're trying to unravel it, right? So um, making a will is important at any stage of your life, even minors, a minor who has whom whom his parents have left property to, right? But who is a minor can make a will. Right through his trustee, right through his next best friend. But all it is is this is how I want my properties to be handled after I die. Now, this is who I appoint to make those decisions. To make those decisions. Yeah. So that person you appoint is called a trustee mm -hmm. or an executor. And there are strict rules affecting trustees and affecting executors. Very strict rules, right? Mm -hmm. I'm also handling situations right now um, where the trustee has abused um, his powers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, abused his powers and mingled his money with that of. Um, so the, 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 when when the testator, the testator is the person who makes a will. Mm -hmm. When the testator was ill and incapacitated, mm -hmm. the trustee under a power of attorney, mingled money mm -hmm. with the testator's funds. And then because the trustee is also the trustee under the will, it then continued. Sorry, because the attorney is also was also trustee under the will, the thing continued. So the beneficiaries then approached me and then you know that's that's what one of the issues we're dealing with now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the law affecting trustees is very strict. There is a trusteeship act which has been amended recently, right? So, but um, the law in that area is very strict against trustees. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So in the will, you mentioned who your trustee will want to be. You mentioned who your beneficiaries will be. Oh, I'm giving this to this person. I'm giving this to that person, right? Mm -hmm. So when you come to Chuck, Chuck would get the details of oh, you know, this is what I want to give to this person. Some people have um, some people have asked me what do I think, um, what do you advise and all of that, you know, and um, I've been very careful knowing that making a will is a very sensitive thing, right? Of um, course, yep. Yeah, it's a very sensitive thing. So when I, when I come across such questions, I try to dig deeper, you know? I have a client who said to me, oh, this, this my child has not been close to me and all that, but you know, I'm, I just want to do this, so I want to do that and stuff. And you know, and so I had to dig deeper to find out what else, right? What, what were the reasons mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And um, you know, so it, it's a very delicate area of law. Um, some people have said it reminds me of death. Well, um, there is nobody who has a dying date, <laughs> right? There is nobody who has a dying date, right? Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows, right? There are people, young people who have died from several things, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So every day reminds us of death. Everything reminds us of death, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. So just like everything reminds us of life, right? So you, you just make a will. It's advisable to make a will. For those in the military, make a will. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and you have property, make a will. So if somebody comes to you to do a will, they'll mm -hmm. likely be introduced to an EPA and a yeah. PD. Can you tell us what those stand for okay. and what they cover? Thank you. So when you come to make a will, Chuck does not like to just make a will for you, right? Chuck will also um, let you know about two other instruments 
one of them is a personal directive, right? So a personal directive is a document that speaks to who will make medical decisions for you when you become incapacitated. Okay. Who will make medical decisions on your behalf? So to speak, who will pull the plug, right? Okay. Make serious medical decisions on your behalf, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing we always provide in our power in our personal directive is this that this personal directive will not come into effect except you have been examined by two doctors and they verify. This is the capacity test yes, that you're referencing. The capacity yeah. test, right. Now, the second document is a power of attorney. That one is a more serious, maybe I shouldn't say more serious, um, health issues are serious too, right? But of course. a power of attorney, is, the seriousness of it is that it gives your attorney complete control over your properties. So finances is essentially what it covers? Bank accounts, yeah. building, homes, mm -hmm. anything that is property, your cars. Mm -hmm. the, the, the power of attorney puts your attorney in your position. So for the personal directive, the person who runs the decisions is called an agent. Mm -hmm. In your power of attorney is called an attorney. So that attorney, that document gives the person the authority to make financial decisions. So that matter I was telling you about, this individual had a power of attorney. So he made the decision to mingle his money with, with that of the, the, um, the, the, um, the person who gave the power of attorney. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because he mingled it, our case is now that he did not make a decision in the best interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So now, so the personal directive has to do with your health when you become incapacitated, not death. Mm -hmm. Then the power of attorney has to do with your properties when you become incapacitated, not death, right? Mm -hmm. And I always advise people. So when you come to me and say, Chuck, this is who I want to be my agent. This is who I want to be my attorney. I always advise people and say, this attorney, what is your level of trust? How confident are you that this person would make proper financial decisions on your behalf? Mm -hmm. Right? Good. So we always ask people to be very careful. You want to know who it is you're making your attorney. Okay? So three instruments, your will, your personal directive, and your power of attorney. Your will is, a, you know, a will is what we call ambulatory. Ambulatory means something speaking from death. Mm -hmm. Good. A power of attorney is that you're living, but I'm incapacitated. This is who my attorney is to take care of everything. Mm -hmm. um, a, a personal directive is I am also living but I'm also incapacitated. You know, I don't want to be left on life support forever. Mm -hmm. Let my attorney make the decision, my agent make the decision as to when to pull the plug, mm -hmm. right? Or um, I am in a coma and they need to give me a kind of medicine to do this or that. My agent should make that decision, mm -hmm. all right? So those three documents go together. Please, um, if you go to make a will, ask your lawyer about the other two documents. It's important. Those three things go together. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can make a will only. You can make a power of attorney only. Or you can make a personal directive only. But Chuck will advise, you know. And uh, you know, always take your lawyer's advice. Chuck's advice. You, 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 you should make, we should make sure that the three documents are made for you and executed okay perfect All beautiful right. okay i think that's it for today anything else team thanks chuck, chuck. Are we good? you are the man <laughs> <laughs>